Well, thank you so much for coming today and welcome to Aziza Shdenova, my cocoon titans, Colours Teas, uh, and to our panel discussion, which today we have chosen to title Mirrors and Memory. Um, this is our second curatorial project at Iron Mind Space. We're in the Madic Arts Project based in London, and we work with an international community of artists on really a diverse range of projects that showcase art from an interdisciplinary perspective. So we'd like to open up the evening firstly by thanking Exposed Arts Projects for helping to realise this project. Um, also to our artists and to our panellists for making this all happen and to our lovely audience again as well for interacting and celebrating uh, the show with us. So this evening I'd like to introduce you to our panel who will be discussing this new body of work and the exhibition. Firstly we have Aziza Shadenova. Shadenova is a Kazakh artist born in Uzbekistan. She graduated from Central St Martin's College of Art and Design in 2011 and now lives and works in Hastings in the UK. She was one of the first young artists featured in the Central Asian Pavilion at the 55th Venice Biennale in 2013 and has participated in group shows internationally, including the Sotheby's, the Moscow Biennale, Home Gallery in Manchester and the Kyrgyz National Museum of Fine Arts. Her work is in private and institutional collections internationally, including the Lachlan Collection in the US, and she's been invited to participate in the Sharjah Biennale and the upcoming exhibition Clouds and Power by Slaz and Tata in Hong Kong, both next year. Next, we have Indira Jispeva Ziavek, who is an independent curator and co-founder of International Art Development Association, a non-profit organisation supporting and promoting contemporary art from Kazakhstan and Central Asia. Indira studied history of art at University College London before founding Iron Man Space in 2022. She has curated and co-curated numerous international projects, including one of the projects of the National Museum Focus Kazakhstan Post Nomadic Mind at the Warping Hydraulic Power Station in London in 2018, and the private pavilion of Kazakhstan One Step Forward, which was held at the 55th Venice Biennale. And we have Dr. Maya Kachkeli, who is a psychoanalyst and member of the British Psychoanalytical Society. She's currently in full-time private practice in London, and she teaches psychoanalytic theory at IOPA, BPA, and UCL. Besides being a psychoanalyst, she's been involved in various artistic pursuits herself, and her main area of interest is an overlap of creativity and psychoanalysis. Her 2017 paper, Beyond Words, won the Winnicott Essay Prize, marking the publication of the collected works of D.W. Winnicott by Oxford University Press in 2017. And her paper, Holding and Visceral Attention, Bodily Concentration of an Analyst Under COVID-19 Lockdown, won the Rosika Parker Prize in 2020, run by the Journal of British Psychotherapy, where it was published. So today we're going to start with an open conversation where our panellists will each contribute uh, parts of their thinking, their writing and their processing of the exhibition. Then towards the halfway mark, we will open up the floor to a more conversational tone. So you're very welcome to interject with any questions or comments that you'll have. And we just hope it's a very convivial and friendly atmosphere where we can just celebrate the work. So um, I'll pass it over to Indira to open up the conversation. Thank you, Phoebe. Uh, Phoebe is not as actually, she forgot to introduce like, <laughs> herself. So. Yes, Phoebe <laughs> is a curatorial assistant of uh, Ina Line Art Space, uh, art historian with a very interesting range of uh, research uh, um, interests. <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, do you want to mention a couple of things? Sure, yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, sure. Um, so I hold a BA and MA in Art History from UCL um, and my research predominantly focuses on women artists and queer artists, uh, radical retelling and storytelling within those lines of thought and within the kind of corporeal complex and the representations of the women in the And now I work with my line space as part of the curatorial team. No, I'm especially very happy. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, so <clears throat> let's start. Yes, absolutely. Looking at a butterfly, one could easily go back to a memory from a childhood. When running after one, to glance the beauty of their, of their wings. Philosophers and writers are often seduced by the metaphor of a butterfly. 
thinking about butterflies and moth, a scholar Vlad Ionescu very interestingly reflects on the figural conception of the image from the perspective of art historical discipline. Uh, I'm gonna read a couple of lines from his text, text uh, on moss and butterflies or how to orient oneself through images. Georges Didier Berman's uh, Art Criticism in Context. Their regular fluttering around points to an inherent indeterminacy specific to images whose latency of sense remains to be discovered. No authentic image is fixed and framed, dated and situated in history once and for all. On the contrary, the erratic image has a dynamic relation to other images, and thus it establishes a connection between past and present. I believe in this solo exhibition as in a Shadenova plays with space and time. Uh, the mirror room allows the artist to create an un unbounded space where she opens the portal between past and present, as well as conscious and unconscious. Shadenova's artworks mirror her dreams and memories, highlighting the fluidity of time, exposing the past but keeping the latency. The viewer is invited to follow the irregular fluttering and delve into Turkos dreams. So Ada, I would like to start from the title and uh, ask you maybe to tell us a little bit more about it. Uh, well, uh, we were talking about the uh, this butterfly effect and um, currently all of my work is uh, was kind of made in, uh, when I was thinking about my childhood mainly, uh, the moment of my child me being a child and uh, kind of growing up towards uh, to my teenage years and to me that uh, resonated with the butterfly and then I started kind of researching about different poems that I liked and there was one by Emily Dickinson um, and uh, it had these lines my cocoon titans colors tease and it kind of resonated with me because uh, that moment when you're kind of a child in a cocoon and you're not really yet a woman but you're kind of in between uh, resonated with those lines and uh, Phoebe actually <laughs> knows the whole poem yeah, I uh, by heart so uh, would be nice if I, you, yes, yeah. 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 you could uh, recite it. Yes, yeah. this is the moment it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she recited beautifully. So the poem reads, my cocoon titans colors tease, I'm feeling for the air. A dim capacity for wings demeans the dress I wear. A power of butterfly must be the aptitude to fly. Meadows of majesty concedes and easy sweeps of sky. So I must baffle at the hint and cipher at the sign and make much blunder if at last I take the clue divine. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, Phoebe. I love when you're reciting it. Yeah. Um, very good. Um, Aza, so uh, quite often, uh, I think in your um, practice, uh, you play with symbols. And I wanted to ask you, for example, you there was um, one symbol, a plant, that you used quite often, and actually you're still using it because we can see it all, all over in this exhibition. Um, but actually, for this exhibition, you are also playing with symbols, like more protective kind of symbols, uh, like Zoroastrian butterflies, these inverted triangles. Um, and there is actually the meaning behind it. it uh, one triangle is good words, another one is good thoughts, and they meet at the line of good deeds. So, uh, apart from this, butterflies, there are also colors that is so much present. Uh, maybe, and camels. And camels. <laughs> and camels, yeah. So maybe you can uh, speak about on symbolism and... Uh, yeah. Well, I uh, kind of from the start of my artistic practice, I like to use the kind of symbol, symbolic images. And to me, the, uh, the, the symbolism of the plaque means the, the strong woman because uh, back in nomadic countries like you would always see women pla plaiting their hair because uh, 
uh, obviously if you uh, have long hair and you don't uh, put tie it up it means that it will not allow you to work and do all the chores you know so you have to flat it and to me it's a, kind of a symbol for me as a, a strong woman responsible woman woman who works woman who you know feeds the kids and all that um, and also uh, visually I quite like the, 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 the visual um, aspect of the plaid as well um, it's just something natural about it and the way it's uh, braided and uh, uh, hence the um, my use of symbolism of the, the butterflies as well because the actual bow on the end of the plaid looks like a butterfly and to me that as well resonated with my childhood because in post-soviet countries all the kids uh, that were in school used to wear huge bows and <laughs> huge like bows on their um, ponytails and everywhere and to me that was the symbol of the childhood as well um, but uh, thinking about the symbols I use they're all kind of feminine and to me I wanted to uh, destroy that meaning by using the colors as well because to uh, most people colors uh, mean something uh, kind of not as feminine it's uh, more related to a man and uh, in my in my work i use colors as uh, something feminine uh, because i actually talk about the emancipation of central asian women um, and how during soviet era how they emancipated central asian women especially in uzbekistan um, they were allowed to study and work uh, in factories uh, hence they put on the colors and you know started to be a bit more professional so that's kind of my homage to those women as well um, yeah most of my symbols are like very feminine but even like the in uh, using using the camels i never use them as one i always have to put a uh, second one on top uh, make this kind of connection intertwining them and you could see in my shoulders loads of uh, Inter intertwining, uh, puzzling together. There's always this connection with the the female, I suppose. Uh, it's interesting, like because w w now when you're talking about uh, this, um, I can see now the fluidity how the, your plaids go into the colors, you know, um, and uh, it's it's a new symbol that is present. And uh, on this note, actually, I would like to ask Maya to share your impression of the exhibition and uh, maybe to read your text that you prepared. Oh yes, it's just a comment um, uh, about plants and camels and you'll find it also some sort of um, uh, weaving Maybe. together. It's also another plant if yeah. you like. Yeah, yeah. Um, something about, in fact, um, <laughs> for me, um, uh, this exhibition is about a girl in plants. Um, and uh, I decided to put it in an um, experientially psychoanalytic sense so that it's not just allowed me to just say or if it's in, uh, and I'm happy to say more about uh, different aspects that I will talk about it if you're curious about. At the end of the space created by Aziz's artwork, I feel dizzy, caught up in the dancing hands overcome by childlike delight in its swirl. I could hear plaids swooshing as they entangle and disentangle in the frenzy of spiraling bodies. An occasional slap on the cheeks, bittersweet memories of letting go. Plaids open up the imaginary scene set of the mother's hands, gently teasing out her daughter's curls into sacred strands. A plaid is a feminine link existential for a baby in the womb cocoon, but the one that has to be cut in time of birth. As a preoccupation with plants seems to me merge into her quest for the origins of the self. The hovering girls in plants look into the mirror, wondering, is it a visual image we see that defines us? Jacques Lacan, in his paper, this is like a French psychoanalyst, in his paper, The Mirror Stage, identified that there is the first time when an infant between the ages of 6 and 18 months perceives an image in the mirror and identifies it as I, the self. Uh, and I quote from the, his paper, unable as yet to walk or to stand up, and held tightly as he is by some support, he 
human or artificial. He nevertheless overcome in a flutter of a jubilant activity the obstructions of his support and fixing his attitude in a slightly leaning forward position. An infant brings back an instantaneous aspect of the image. So it's a baby looking into the mirror. The infant's jubilation shared by the mother, who is usually only there with her, with her six months old, and says, "Sip," saying, look, it's you, pointing to the image in the mirror. Gestel, the, the toddler sees this unified image must be in discordance with how fragmented and helpless he must feel due to the corporeal immaturity. The specular image at once is and is not the infant who identifies with it and assumes the otherness in his self. Lacan argues that this is a founding moment of alienation, reconnaissance, which translates as non-recognition, obliviousness, because there is this otherness, it is in his mouth, it looks like him, but it does not feel like him because he is six months old. The, due to immaturity, cannot feel that unification at the sensorial level. Um, this gulf between the self experience and the representation is going to reflect the inner schism, the lifelong alienation of the human subject from its core. Nevertheless, this is the condition for an entry into the representation of symbolic world. Inspired by Lacan, the British psychoanalyst, uh, Donald Winnicott, invoked the mother's face as the precursor of the mirror. The paradigm of his study is the mother baby as a unit, a psychic cocoon facilitating the birth of subject's primary identity, psychic identity. So I quote from him, what does a baby see when he or she looks at the mother's face? I am suggesting that ordinarily what the baby sees is himself or herself. In other words, the mother is looking at the baby and what she looks like is related to what she's, she sees there. So what the mother looks like must represent, reflect what she sees for the baby, baby's state. End of quote. The maternal gaze receives the infant's state and the maternal face reflects back a feeling image. These reflections are first representations of the emerging self. Here, the otherness of the mother becomes the pliable medium. To use the concept of an artist and another psychoanalyst, Mother Milner. The maternal face is needed in the image of one's own self. So what do we see when we're looking at artist paintings? Somewhat provocatively and playful, other girls and twats have blank faces. They are hardly detect there are hardly detectable traces of facial features in their whiteness. Were they wiped out or have they not yet evolved? Do they depict negative hallucination, according to another psychoanalyst, Andrea Cohen, or the pregnant emptiness, that, so that emptiness that is about to give birth to a future? These white silhouettes are surrounded and held by the cocoon of color green. In another painting, these girls transform into water lilies swimming amongst green clouds. Green was the favorite color and I'm quoting, favorite color of the Prophet Muhammad. In the Quran, the robes were worn in paradise and silk couches scattered amidst the trees are both the color of lilies. And in medieval Islamic poetry, Mount Oaf, the celestial mountain, the sky above it and the water at its feet are all depicted in shades of green. End of quote. I spent my childhood nature. As Anna tells me and told me, I hear her nostalgia that echoes the universal pining for the lost paradise. I see the freshness of the green in spring and I smell the scent of grass after rain. 
I feel softness of the kilt, a visual blanket, the maternal hands teaching, piecing together various bits to create a textile cocoon. I see white collars having unbuttoned themselves and turned into flower buds to blossom, butterflies to flutter away, lips to seduce. Once the artist's subjectivity liberates them from their conventional identity, colors like color green or the kilt lift a veil of infantile amnesia. Infantile amnesia is the forgetfulness that doesn't remember a child. Lift a veil of infantile amnesia and seeing becomes a form of time travel. It is to say that I do not just see myself when I talk art, but in view what I see with my divine memory traces. I apperceive, which means I create what I see. Through this process, the dialectics of the mirroring is re-established between me, the viewer, and the artwork. But what does my experience tell us about the dialectics between the artist and her artwork? Is uh, is Aza hiding behind these images? Or is she revealing herself to them? Maybe she can tell us later. <laughs> Perhaps this dilemma is more clearly depicted by a girl against the red backdrop looking from behind a huge vase, like a teeny child clinging onto her mother's skirt. Half emerged, half hidden, divided by the conflict, as I see it. The wish to look and the wish not to be exposed. She also warns us not to take what we see at face value. The other alienated half remains in the darkness of the unconscious. Another reference to the need to be protected would be the waterfall curtain made of the charms to warn, of the, uh, to warn off the evil eye, often pink as the newborn's coat. According to psychoanalytic perspective, childhood memories undergo endless metamorphosis, and in the present of remembrance, these painted scenes have the feel but screen memories. Quote, they reveal and conceal at once the alienated core of the self. And I finish with the beginning quotes quote. In the artist of all kinds, I think one can detect an inherent dilemma, which belongs to the coexistence of two threats, the urgent need to communicate and the still more urgent need not to be found. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Thank you. I hope I was. <laughs> Brilliant. 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 This is most, the most amazing uh, analysis <laughs> I've heard about my work. It's quite interesting when you said about, yeah, who, to answer your question about why yeah, yeah, yeah. revealing or concealing. I think it's all kind of came to me naturally uh, not to put any eyes and face because I feel like um, if you do that, then you always look at some, you will always try to find this particular character. It's your sister or it's your mother or it's the friend you know. But by not showing the face, it becomes a bit more universal. And, uh, and also in Islamic uh, architecture, they weren't allowed to use the facial features. Uh, tradition, traditionally, they used only geometry. And um, so, yeah, I think I was just, without making it kind of too obvious, and also as well as ageless, like those girls will always just be girls in a way and uh, but then someone will look at them and they would say like maybe it's an older woman because mm -hmm. you can uh, tell so much by the, the face and the, the scars and the wrinkles and so to me it's like just a woman you know <laughs> um, but obviously the girls with plaits uh, to me plaits resonated And I remember you also mentioned that uh, your girls looking at the viewer, but you, the viewer actually cannot see the girls mm. much because, like, if, if we look at three butterflies, they, um, 
in a kind of uh, covered a little bit. Yeah, you could l l see a little trace of the eyes, but then perhaps, yes, they're saying, I can see you, but you can't see me because there's a little, this mesh, um, a veil, like an invisible veil, because as you know, uh, during, before the uh, uh, colonization <laughs> of Soviet, um, Uzbek, Uzbek women were covered uh, with burqas and they, and once they've been uh, emancipated, they kind of put the burqas away and were more free and show their hair and face. Uh, so maybe there is still that presence of that burqa, but it's it invisible. It's like a, almost like a mesh. Mm -hmm. So you protect the girls as well. Yeah, they pro they protect themselves. Yeah. <laughs> And they're free from male gaze, I guess. Yes. <laughs> kind of. Yeah, I think uh, your women are quite strong, you know, characters. Because, like, looking at this exhibition, and when I look at your girls, um, I don't, I don't see, then I don't feel it as if it is a bad memory. Like, if it's a bad memory or a memory, but it's kind of a, like an acceptance or recognition of something that you maybe analyze, going back to memories. Uh, yeah, but uh, I also like the, the idea when you said about the, the cocoon and how it's the transition of the cocoon becoming a butterfly is such a traumatic and very hard uh, experience and uh, an image of the butterfly, although it looks so fragile, it's such a strong creature because it went from being fluid to like some, some super alien metamorphosis, you know, and to, to me that kind of resonated with my stronger women. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. It's just uh, this kind of fluidity it goes all, all over and there is in so, so like, it's everywhere. Uh, because even if we speak about the colors, uh, you know, that would uh, actually suggest, um, it's just something that, uh, you know, like the colors brought me to to Uzbekistan, to the architecture of Uzbekistan. And then I was, uh, I wondered like, um, you know, in terms of colors, uh, why uh, the turquoise, green, and blue is so much present in Turqu uh, in Uzbekistan, and uh, I've read that, like you know, it kind of makes your eye feel the comfort of like and give you almost like this breeze and sense of water. You know, when it's super hot in Uzbekistan, you look at it and it kind of, it gives you the breeze. You know, like the freshness. So. It seems it's like this fluidity, thinking about the little caterpillar that becomes like fluid, <laughs> uh, absorbs itself and then creates a new body and then it's a new butterfly fluttering all over, you know, like so it's this fluidity is present. Yeah, I think the fluidity kind of rhymes with blue and green, isn't it, as well? Yes. Like, and in the nature, the, the river, as I said, I spent most of my childhood uh, in nature, I'm surrounded by rivers and lakes in Uzbekistan. But that particular color actually um, reminds me of the big domes in ancient Uzbek uh, mosques and uh, ancient buildings. Uh, uh, I, I watched this film by Agnes Varda recently and she went to Iran and she filmed these big domes and she said they look like breasts. <laughs> and to me it's like, Ooh, yeah, they do green breast. <laughs> <laughs> um, but also the green, you know, this Western idea of uh, when you're young, you're so green in a way, you know, mm -hmm. but um, there is a, uh, uh, a song by the can say you're so green and to me it resonates with this being a teenager yeah. because you're still not an adult, you're green. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you are. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so. But there's a fluidity as well in terms of your kind of practice as well. So we're talking about the collars and how you've transformed them into imagery in terms of with your girls. But for the installation in the vase, they're the flowers. For mural works, they're installations or sculptural pieces, but they're also kind of these bas reliefs and things like that. So there's this whole fluidity in, in your practice and symbols kind of ebb and flow throughout different works, the cotton and, and the, the butterflies and things like that. So there's this really beautiful sense of fluidity just in the objects and the subjects that you use as well. Yeah, I, I kind of like, uh, you know, um, I've been in uh, doing my art for about 15 years or maybe a little bit more, 
but uh, I do still like to experiment. I feel like I'm searching and searching and try different mediums. I started as a video maker, filmmaker, uh, moved to photography, and then from that I went into painting, sculpture, and performance. So with me, uh, if I get fascinated by a, a subject, an object, of like colors, I'll try to do experiment everything with them by putting uh, them together as a puzzle, by putting them on the canvas, by using them in my paintings, sketchbooks. Um, to me, a painting is like a sketchbook as well, you know. Um, so yeah, I try to uh, uh, work with a with an object and demolish it and do transform it. transform it. Yeah, to give it a new life. To give it a new life, like you uh, will have a tour maybe later to explain about uh, new work. But there is a painting where I put. Uh, five paintings, I've cut them all up, my old work that I wasn't happy about and I've made uh, them into a new piece, I will weave them together and uh, gave it a new lease of life as well so there is a uh, yeah, lot of experiments going on <laughs> But also as a, as a new creation and as the first is considered by destruction and cutting that's mm -hmm. a necessary condition and it's like, you know, being a teenager, we try so many things. We, uh, one week we're into rock music, another week we're like on a dance floor, <laughs> you know, and we're going through these different stages trying to find ourselves, who we are. But, yeah, that's it, we lose your identity. identity and I yeah. thought that this is the part where you uh, mirror God, his face, it mirrors mm -hmm. whoever, whoever is looking yeah. into. It's also a purity of identity, but you cannot pin it down. You pin down, you pin the butterfly down, but it dies. You yeah. cannot pin it down. Mm -hmm. It has to. But um, also, I was thinking, who is it in terms of and um, this cocoon and metamorphosis in, in terms of what happens to memories? Because it was a very naive to think that what we remember now, this is what happened. Yeah, that's true. Uh, that's 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 not how it is. So every person is in a way creator of um, their own narratives and memories. So our own memories kind of go constant revision with yeah. this poet work by metamorphosis, they change. Yeah. Uh, and also there is this um, um, fluidity between our memories and what happens, what's happening in our lives, which memories are reawakened mm -hmm. and become so actual. Mm -hmm. uh, so one word for the obsessed now with this Kids and not them, and so all of that, um, uh, if you like, interaction between internal, internal past and present is very much of the forming identity. But it's I think that it's very important to think to to put it in terms of uh, that it's always fluid identity. Mm -hmm. We just are very scared to think that that actually uh, we are uh, we are not fixed. If we're fixed, we're dead. Yes. Because, um, you know, like just in the same text by Nesco, he speaks about butterflies uh, when they're fluttering, you know, and uh, it, it made me actually think about, you know, going back to, <laughs> to my childhood memories and thinking that when you observe the butterfly, when it flies, you can't really see the pattern and you wait and it's a, a bit irritating to see what the colors are, you know, <laughs> and you can only see, uh, see the full picture once it's like sit and uh, like, you know, for a moment and then it flies again. So he's mentioning that, you know, like you can see what is a pattern because when they're flying, it always changes. Yeah. And you can only see it once you pin it, you know, yeah. so, but then it's dead. Yeah, then you keep it. Yeah, absolutely, you know, yeah. so that was very interesting. And if you can hide this because the evanescence, mm -hmm. uh, right, is the, the heart is for us humans to mm -hmm. accept. Yeah. But there's definitely this element of um, it, it's destructive and, and difficult and we're kind of moving through it, but there's also this sense of play and experimentation that you bring up as well. And I think Exposed Arts Projects as a space is really able to facilitate that in terms of the mirrors and the kind of amazing kind of cocoon of memories we've been able to construct in that space as well. And maybe you could tell us a bit about girls hovering and and about how the mirrors themselves work with the works as well and the kind of experience of seeing the works. 
I think, yeah, we've been very fortunate to have this space. <laughs> Thank you to the founder. Um, at first, it was kind of like, wow, it's, it's going to be difficult and challenging, but uh, me and Indira, the curator, we had quite a lot of fun, uh, especially <laughs> in BB. Yeah. Um, but especially with this work of girls hovering, it's a, a silhouette and it's literally like six paintings, but we put them together side by side and we nail them kind of to the wall. And, um, push them flat against the mirror and they kind of made this reflection showing like almost butterfly wing effect mm -hmm. and also um, butterfly wing effect but also like they become uh, almost like an, they become an object you know, almost sculptural yeah. if you turn it yeah. like that yeah and it reminds us of the the, the loft <laughs> what's it called platter the, 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 the test the, 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 the ink ah. ah. the ah. Rocher, Rocher. Rocher test yeah, yeah. Uh, and it's quite a nice uh, way of like just looking and seeing them uh, in a different way. Um, they they become another object mm -hmm. almost. They be, you, some people don't see the girls. Yeah, they see some size. It was a very interesting way of uh, just listening uh, different uh, yeah, associations. Yeah. <laughs> but I think as well, like when you look at one work, you instantly look at the work behind you and you don't even like turn your head. You, mm -hmm. There is this kind of portal. Uh, portal, yeah, and you almost don't want to really see another work, but it's just there, you can't avoid it. <laughs> and it's almost like you're trying to link two together, and it's an interesting perspective um, by looking at these things. And I also enjoyed painting on the walls with white marker pen. There is something childish in my drawings, but it came to me very naturally. And, uh, um, you know, like when you're a kid, you just want to obliterate all the walls and like paint them. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah. But you're constantly uh, you're constantly creating your own cocoon. Mm, exactly. Yeah. Mm. Sure. Yeah, Questions. of course. I mean, the the floor is open for anyone who'd like to ask questions. Um, but I mean, I've well, I've kind of sat in this space for for a few weeks now, and I'm. And you know, seeing the project develop, so I've also got a lot of questions. So I'll ask them, <laughs> and if people want to kind of pop in, they're very welcome to. Um, and I guess, I mean, again, thinking with the mirrors, they're such in kind of our day to day and in kind of culture, this locus of identity and being. You know, we look in mirrors to kind of ground and think about our bodies and ourselves, our bodies and ourselves. And I just wondered, in terms of obviously making the works it's a form of process and thinking for you. But having the works installed in this space, have you like reached any conclusions? Have you learned anything about yourself or you know, moving forward or understanding yourself better through not only just making them, but having them in a show together? Yeah, I think uh, it kind of uh, taught me a lot actually, because uh, I, as I said, I've been doing so many different uh, techniques and mediums in my art practice. And uh, the painting is uh, the kind of last, um, the, the current one. And uh, now I look at the painting differently. I, I don't look at it as just a flat uh, surface. I, I know that although it is flat, it is, um, but you can make almost an object out of a canvas. And to me, I think it's quite interesting when I saw these kind of works in the space and how they could reflect and how they could be hanged and uh, positioned differently. I could, uh, I will always, uh, yeah, bring it into my future work and try not to look at the canvas as just a flat surface because uh, it's uh, much more than just that, you know. And uh, definitely this space, uh, it was quite challenging and uh, yeah, it taught me a lot about how to even the work, work uh, the works work with each other and together like that. Um, as I said, like when I looked at uh, different works reflecting, although I didn't want to just yet look at the, the other work, uh, somehow it made me realize that two works uh, combined could look pretty amazing, even though you're not intentionally uh, supposed to do it, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's fascinating. <coughs> and I think it becomes really interesting because then it becomes a question of like presence and absence as well, like what you can see and can't see and again this idea of are we revealing ourselves or are we concealing in this space as well. And another thing that, that I was thinking about in terms of like the plaits and, and so much of it is like a matrilineal or maternal history, but the mothers 
and the maternal family, matrilineal family, isn't actually represented in the works. They've got hands that might be mothers, mm -hmm. and we've got kind of the the plaits and things like that, but there's no explicit reference to the mother. It's almost like a, a trace or an index of that, um, which I think is incredibly interesting because then it becomes about what the body remembers, the touch of the mother, the smell of the mother, things like that. Um, so I thought that was really beautiful, and I didn't know if that was something that you were consciously thinking of, like whether your family would be explicitly referenced, or if it's more the impact they've left on you, and kind of girls in general, the impact a family has on girls in general. I think with this show, I wanted to make it almost like a self-portrait show, mm -hmm. um, because in my older practice, I did have a few works named Mothers and Daughters, and uh, to me, I um, explored that theme of the mother, uh, with this uh, current show, I wanted to explore what's actually my mother gave to me as a person. And um, even in the work uh, Girls Hovering, uh, that idea of my mother saying, you know, you should make sure our guests are uh, full and happy and make sure that their cups are full of tea. Hence, I was hovering around the Dastakhan, which is this table in Central Asia. So it's that kind of, you know, um, narrative of the motherly acts of like you have to do this and that and <laughs> and but as well as uh, you know just uh, remembering my childhood memories of like me being raised just by my mother we didn't have a, a dad we i was raised up by a few my mama and, and my aunt just females all over and lots of dancing lots of parties so i remember it kind of you can see it reflects in my uh, works of uh, dancing heads, all these like floods tangling with each other. But there is also a, a big sense of uh, motherhood in my quilt painting because uh, it kind of um, says a lot about the protection and how um, says a lot about the history of giving a quilt for a dowry, uh, for a bride, how the moms used to give these blankets for nomad nomadic families especially mm -hmm. to to the bride and then how there is another meaning of how the bride could make a quilt and send it back to her family from her new new house and um, there would be an encrypted encrypted messages of how she's doing in this new family so there is still like this underlying uh, theme of this motherly care i suppose and uh, conversations mm -hmm. going together yeah. It's always there. It's just it's never it's like it's, there's not like a mother. Yeah, yeah, but there's there's always that feeling of tenderness and, and memory, like kind of traces. Which I mean, I I sit with this with this work a lot and, and get to think about it quite a lot. And it's just that's something that I naturally kind of gravitated to is this way that people leave their impressions on us, even if they're not explicitly right next to us all the time. Yeah. Um, which I thought was really poetic and, and beautiful and definitely something that I took from the exhibition um, and I was wondering as well in terms of the the moments that you pick the moments that you choose to share with us was it something that quite organically came out of making your images that that these images kind of came to you organically or did you kind of sit down and go these are the moments and these are what I need to reflect I think they came organically, but uh, you know there is a there is a difference between nostalgia and actually remember the certain parts of your life. Uh, this uh, these images actually came to me when I was working on my um, earlier. There was an exhibition in Switzerland, and um, I made this video installation working with another Kazakh artist and. The installation shows a four-channeled video of my face. I've painted it green and we've put uh, my old VHS footage from my family footage my mom was shooting and I was shooting when I was a kid in Kazakhstan and I've placed them on my face and so some of those images kind of uh, inspired me. Uh, so there was a footage of me setting up the table and there was footage of me like playing outside. So it kind of like it's not like I kind of remember them constantly, but by working at that on that project, made me realize right this this is actually a good point. Maybe I should um, capture it in a painting, or you know. So it was 
pick and choose basically. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, I just thought it was interesting in terms of this. Um, it must be such an interesting experience to try and look back. You know, it's not something that many of us actually do, create an exhibition of our memories and things like that. So it must be a really interesting experience. Um, and I was just, I mean, we knew that we had Maya here and I was thinking about this idea of, you know, things resurfacing and, and the unconscious or things that might spring out, memories that might spring out. Um, so I don't know if anybody has any kind of reactions to the works in terms of maybe things that, that they were surprised by or that memories that, that they had jarred from them that they wanted to share in terms of sensorial memories or anything like that. Um, but maybe when we go around the exhibition, if anyone has a kind of memory that they share, I think that's been a real highlight of showing people the exhibition is they've gone, oh, I remember that. When, you know, when I grew up in Korea, they did the same thing with the watermelons, or yeah. I remember tending to my grandmother and my mother and things like that. So maybe we can uh, go around and discuss that and share that as well. I think that's really I had a question, sorry. Yes. Oh, you yeah. <laughs> yeah, please go. Okay. I thought this quilt it and it's in, in encrypted messages, this is like there's so much out there in that that piece of work. And um, there's this whole tradition, Asian tradition of quilts, rugs, where they bring the outside world into the inside by making, you know, like the garden, the Asian rug is bringing the garden um, or you know the architecture of the landscape into the house and living with it and i'm just so curious to find out all these you know encrypted messages because they're so anthropological about you yeah the, well the the actual quilt was made by these objects that mm. uh, are stuck in my memory you know forever like the watermelon mm. since me being uh, a lot of spending a lot of time in nature i, I captured my own favorite dragonflies mm. and the, um, but there's also some imagery of the uh, ancient, per, from ancient Persian books because I remember all those, uh, you know, growing up in Uzbekistan mm. in the tiles of, of mosaics in mm. the architecture. Of, um, the, the spaces uh, yeah. that are actually present on the facade of Madrasa, on yeah. the main uh, square, mm -hmm. on, on the tiles. And because uh, I, you know, I've been to all of those uh, ancient uh, cities, but, um, it's, it's interesting because the puzzle is, uh, the quilt looks like a puzzle, there's something childish about it, you can assemble it mm -hmm. and uh, play with it, yeah, so there is that kind of connection, but I love the idea of the outside being brought inside, mm -hmm. because as you know, in uh, nomadic families, uh, quilts were like the most important th attribute in the, in the, in the yurt. Uh, Absolutely, yeah, and actually, um, if you look at the yurt from the outside, it would be you wouldn't see much. It would be very very minimal. But when once you enter inside, it would be embellished with these ornaments. But the ornaments would be writing and blessings from a woman, from a mother, um, almost like very caring and like uh, holding holding the yurt and holding the family. So it will, it's actually very. And it was uh, kind of like a blank canvas outside, but inside is full of color everywhere, isn't it? Full yeah, of texture yeah. and color as well. Yeah. But that, uh, uh, you know how people say that you, you, you give a quilt uh, as a dowry. I made it for myself. I didn't need to wait for everyone. It's like, this is my dowry and with it, I kind of protect myself from my memories, you know, because our memories do protect ourselves. What we learn is how we don't avoid making the same mistakes and things like that, you know. But in this instance, it's just good memories, you know, from childhood, I suppose. And I love that as well. So just in terms of the end, the final stanza of the poem, it's I'll baffle at the hint, I'll cipher at the sign, I'll make much blunder, you know, I'll take the clue divine. It's this real sense of, I'm gonna work this out and I'm gonna work through it and I'm, I'm gonna get agency and, and make my own voice and expression. And it, it seems kind of, like it wasn't um, intentional, but it's definitely occurred that you've done that in this exhibition and you've kind of taken the clue divine in a way and made this kind of code of your own. So it's, it's, it's incredibly symbolic as well. But sorry, did we have any other questions? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I have a question. You mentioned that the um, um, our dome um, uh, of Uzbekistan um, 
had no impact on you and they are visible uh, in your works. And looking at these girl, girl um, uh, paintings, I can see the image, this uh, white mm -hmm. shape. Yeah. Yeah. It um, reminds me of the image of a dome or maybe of a door. Um, if it is a dome, um, then the question um, is um, um, what, um, how important is religion for you? And because you said that this exhibition is kind of a self-portrait of you, whether you thought about it or not, and uh, in general, how important is religion for, for, uh, for a woman in Uzbekistan now? Because uh, before, before the Soviet time, I guess religion was the uh, most oppressive, maybe, uh, thing. Prohibited. And uh, now, I mean, when women uh, want to free themselves from um, um, from men, from religion, and um, uh, in general to be free, um, what is the role now of, um, uh, of religion <coughs> for 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 Uzbek women? And of course, um, as there are no pictures. This um, uh, image of, um, of a dome or of, um, of a yurt is even more visible, it's even more symbolic. It's like um, it can include everything. So what, what is um, um, a dome or religion for you? Is it your mom or is it um, just a woman in general? This is the most important thing. Um, um, I think it's really, it, it is related very much to your face. So you wanted to um, make it like a supreme, supreme shape, maybe a supreme form. Um, and yeah, well, just in interesting to um, uh, know your thoughts. Yeah, interesting is that it, you see the dome because uh, yeah. originally it's actually a gate. Uh, so in Uzbekistan, uh, when you see the Metrics. Yes, like uh, yeah, yeah, the, the entrance of the facade, uh, it usually have this shape, but it's uh, obviously, you can see it everywhere, like in Iran or any Arabic countries in, in Persia. But yeah, to me, it represented this kind of gate through the maybe subconscious of a woman or the, the gate to, the, to see the gaze of a woman. But maybe you have to go inside to actually see her eyes and her mouth and things like that. But uh, in terms of talking about religion, um, I wasn't brought up in a Muslim family, and uh, but I remember growing up in Uzbekistan. He, there is still a reminiscence of the Soviet era, still, and um, almost like in a way European. You know, we still had like how do you say it? Yes, it wasn't like uh, it wasn't as religious as it is now because I think the the times have changed now, and I heard I don't go back. To Uzbekistan um, for that often like last time I've been was uh, about 10 years ago maybe but uh, I do see the difference and how it's changing uh, towards more an Islamic uh, country I suppose mm -hmm. but uh, when I was growing up I, I saw none of that and uh, whenever I went to like these ancient um, cities as well um, all the women were not covered they were still you know wearing uh, mini skirts and things like that. But now, I, uh, when I even Google Uzbekistan, I see a totally different picture of women there. And they're all mo mostly of them covered. They they wear headscarves. Um, so yeah, it's interesting how, um, as as you will see in the tour, my work talks about the emancipation of women uh, during Sovietization and um, how they were emancipated not for the sake of emancipation of women, but because the so Soviet people need to needed extra hands you know to do the fields and things um, however i'm sure women benefited because they they started studying and working but now i feel like we're kind of going backwards and uh, you know talking about even listening to news in tajikistan how women are not supposed to uh, paint their nails anymore it's like so bizarre to me you know hearing about it now it's like it's going backwards uh, but yeah thank you for your question did I answer it? <laughs> <laughs> well, of course, yeah, thank you very much. But uh, yeah, also Uzbekistan is full of different symbols because, um, I mean, this uh, architecture, it, it gives all these symbols from 
pre-Islamic period. In pre-Islamic period was Zoroastrianism and uh, all those but uh, Zoroastrian butterflies and many other uh, symbols from from Tengrism as well. They are still present in the architecture, and I think uh, while uh, you were growing, you, you kind of you had this exposure of seeing them and thinking. About it as well. Yeah, and obviously, you know, through uh, Soviet times, there were not just uh, Uzbeks living in Uzbekistan. There were Koreans, Russians, and there are always like multitudes of really different religions, religions and <coughs> cultures, <coughs> cultures as well. Like my, uh, although uh, I represent myself as a Central Asian, <laughs> but uh, my actual uh, ethnicity is uh, my mom is um, Kazakh. Uh, my dad is half Uzbek, half Ukrainian, so there is a different uh, blood running. <laughs> uh, so yeah, yeah, but still, I mean, in our countries, we still have uh, so many different nationalities. No, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And I know that for Soviet painters, it was um, a kind of freedom to be in uh, Uzbekistan. They enjoyed more freedom, freedom in uh, art and uh, creativity, uh, and uh, even. Um, um, of uh, ex uh, exhibitions and museums, like for example the museum in um, um, Karakalpakis. In, uh, I can't pronounce it. Karakalpakistan? Karakalpakistan. Yeah. Sorry. In, <laughs> in, 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 in yeah. of Russian avant-garde. The biggest yeah, yeah, museum yeah, yeah. of Russian avant-garde yeah. and that was possible because it was not so strict, not so much regulated at yeah. that time. Yeah. Yeah. There was also this, uh, I don't remember the title of the book, but the, they actually commis commissioned Rachenko uh, to make this book on uh, uh, cotton harvesting. And he created this amazing uh, avant-garde book on Uzbeks harvesting cotton. And uh, it's just uh, so, the visually is so dynamic and you still have this like super um, supremacist visuals with like <coughs> Uzbeks and the way he used the Chibiteka, the mm -hmm. hats as well. Uh, but uh, you will see in my old works, I'm very much inspired by uh, suprematism and Russian avant-garde. Um, still, yeah, very prominent in my work, I suppose. Yeah. But it's interesting because, you know, uh, I think it's the, maybe the climate and the different sort of um, uh, cultural aspects. Because, you know, in back in the 30s, the European uh, artists, they were going to like India to get inspired and all these like African countries, you know, it's uh, the exotic, more exotic countries because it's, and I think for Russians, maybe Uzbek and uh, all these Central Asian uh, countries were kind of exotic as well. And that's why they were inspired. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. it's almost like a, another like Eden, the Garden of Eden. <laughs> She actually answered my question already, I guess. Um, my question was, I was wondering about your kind of national identity, uh, so your kind of heritage, because it feels like, I just couldn't help but looking at this kilt. Yes. Uh, it feels like it's a really syncretic image, like blend of different memories from different kind of cultures. And um, uh, yeah. That's why you, you yeah. kind of answered my question already. Yeah. But it's a mix it's of Uzbek, Kazakh, and probably even this dome thing. It, it yeah. can be subconsciously, I just, I don't know, just like, you know, my speculation. Yeah. Because you, I don't know, you know what I mean, like. But also my uh, Russian friend said there is so much uh, kind of this folkloric uh, visual of Russian fairy tales, you yeah, know? Yeah, yes. uh, There's like, yeah, so it's song, all inspired me, yeah, you know, like, Growing up in Uzbekistan, I went to the uh, school and my first, although the first language was Uzbek, we still had, we spoke Russian in there. And you had, you had like the secondary option to learn Uzbek, but everything was in Russian. So we had like Soviet books, you know, and all these like fairy tales, and all these imagery inspired me so much. It's beautiful, yeah. yeah. Thank you so much, Indira. Yeah. Congratulations, Anata. It's, it's incredible. You brought so much joy. You know, looking at the dragonfly and butterfly, you also I experienced my also childhood, you know. And looking at the kilt, definitely my grandma, she makes kilt and she gives 
went for like for special occasion for the wedding just to protect and also because Kazakhstan is a very hospitable country we almost like you know put all the girls and invite you know um, guests to join on the Dastarhan and also sharing the tea you know sharing the food so it's uh, wonderful thank you and Maya to to be able to I would say connect uh, your view and um, in such a beautiful way you express and it was joyful. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. I also wanted to say a huge thank you, ladies, for bringing this project here because uh, a few you mentioned about mirrors, so you stole my question. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's uh, like a fine thing about the space. Uh, we've been here like for three years now, and uh, it's if you I don't know if you're into Marvel, it's like Marvel comics universe. Yes. But this character, like uh, Doctor Strange, yes. and the same mm -hmm. of Multiverse, yes. this is very much what Exposed is. So every time the artist comes here, mm -hmm. they transform the space. And when you come here, because of the mirrors, you automatically, without really choosing it, you end up getting to that universe. And you see yourself, but somehow altered. And it's like, you find out something else about you. And so, like, uh, thank you so much because I think this exhibition not only like, gave you your self portrait, but also like, to us, like, this very important bit about our portraits and understanding ourselves. And Maya, this, is, this was such a beautiful text. Thank you so much. And uh, I agree with what you done said that it uh, kind of really linked uh, things all together. And I was uh, uh, thinking about myself when I uh, listened to it that, uh, oh my God. I'm at the same time this girl in this place because I still feel like that, but I'm also a mother. <laughs> and I'm still not sure I know very well that person in the mirror. So did I pass the Lacan stage or not? I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a good place to be. Yeah, this if you want to show if you want sure, I would work for you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this this was like huge thank you from the space also for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, yeah, so thank you for yeah. having us. It's wonderful. And also the color of green. It's also my favorite color. I just love, <laughs> love it. Just so it's like a nature, you know. You also beautifully uh, represent colors, and I love the idea that butterflies, like, a, uh, also represent freedom and the path that she, as a, being, being fragile, so free, but at the same time, the path that she takes to be able to be where she, like, how should we see her or like him? <laughs> and uh, yes, and the colors are just beautiful represents like professionalism and power as for, for you and I think for many of us today we all will go and think and return perhaps uh, with other ideas and thoughts so thank you so much yeah. thank you thank you, thank you. Yeah. it's just wonderful when this image represents the power because because of the shapes, the color, the color uh, and relates somehow to man power as well. But on the other hand, when I look at it, I see a dandelion, you know, and it will not yes. dandelion, yeah, dandelion. Yeah, dandelion. Yeah, yes. and it will just disappear if yes. you. Yes. Yeah. 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 It just uh, yes. 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 It's also yeah. it's also uh, those days you see people love stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> yeah. 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 lovers. <laughs> 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 I feel yes, um, yeah, about exactly. so this is was my main kind of um, uh, angle I took as well about mm -hmm. your your um, artwork particularly for this yeah. uh, space because uh, you are very playful mm -hmm. um, uh, how to use the space and uh, again about the colors how you use um, uh, how you play to like your own bisexuality. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't want to judge but the, your masculine and yes. feminine identities mm -hmm. because we that have both. Yes. 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 yes, and it, I think this um, playfulness mm -hmm. is not so so much childish or childlike playfulness. Mm -hmm. It's very uh, inspiring. Yes, and uh, contagious. Absolutely, I agree, Maya. Beautiful. Yeah. Thank yes. you so much. <laughs> yeah. And I love this in the sense of color. Your sense of color. Mm. I think it's yeah. really pretty. Yeah. Just I'm looking at it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. And also, it's very delicious because you can see the bread. You can what see the sun, melon. watermelon yeah. for marinade, and also almost sound of the crab, you know, on the ocean and the. <laughs> you know, you know, and the so you go on and on and on. <laughs> yeah, it just gives you uh, such a uh, 
delicious taste of the till, you know, with uh, beautiful memories and colors just linked to each other. And, you know, it's beautiful to just to look and soothing in a way as well, you know. We should engage with other work yeah. as well, because we've been looking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we 